Starting today through the month of November, I'm going to be doing a little series called I Will Build My Church. And let me explain to you what this is about. <coughs> Excuse me. There's many ways out there that's been told and been promoted about how to grow a church. And since I've been here, we've looked at a number of them. And there's been several that have presented plans and ways that they believe we can grow the church to the elder board and leadership board. And um, we've prayed over and we've looked at it. Um, we've been encouraged to go seeker sensitive. If you don't know what that means, that means a lot of, uh, how would you say, not a lot of referencing the Bible in the sense we may reference it, but it's kind of clouded. Um, very, um, like take for instance, many, a number of years ago, in fact, probably about 15 or 20 years ago, there's a church down in South Florida that I knew the pastor. And when that pastor left, the new pastor came in and he moved it towards seeker sensitive to the point where now he, he goes out on the road and teaches how to do it. And very little confrontation from the word, very super encouraging in the sense of, hey, you're good, you're great, God's blessing you type of stuff, which is nothing wrong with that, okay? But it's, that's what you focus on. Uh, very modern music in the sense of like, um, they started off with, uh, they're opening the service with Black Magic Jesus from Santana, but it was Black Magic Woman. But they changed the word because they, they said, man, we just want to get them in and get them everybody kind of happy about that, you know, and, and let them give them a familiar song. I disagree on that wholeheartedly. Um, the church grew in the sense a lot of people came. Um, it's not doing so well now after about 20 years. Uh, when that pastor left, all that zeal left, and it just kind of crashed, and it's, it's not doing as well. There's business models that are presented um, that many are even come off of Wall Street on how to grow a business and how to promote a business, how to get more tithing, how to get more visitors uh, and hanging on to your visitors and that come and visit. And we looked at ways like that. There's uh, a thing where don't use the phrase the Bible says because most don't understand that because the Bible in today's culture doesn't carry the weight or authority that it did 30 years ago. There's, um, let me tell you a story real quick. Catherine Booth, anybody know who Catherine Booth might have been? Salvation Army, you know, William Booth's wife. One time, and this is a true story, one time during, on Sundays for, for probably several months, she went to different, a different church every Sunday. And what she told her husband she was looking for was this phrase. She was looking for burning words. She was going to a church and looking for burning words. And the sad part about it, she said, according to her, she never found one. Where the preaching was fiery, was burning, not hellfire and brimstone, but just fiery and passionate. And in fact, I've got an article that I've got it with me, but I'm not going to really read anything out of it. But I read an article a number of weeks ago, before, you know, even after I laid out how I wanted to do this, this series, about there's, they're doing all kinds of surveys, and they're finding things out that the surveys that we heard before that people were looking for uh, more friendliness, more, more, you know, easygoing type of services, more... Um, super, super happy, uplifting services, which we need to have. But they're, they're finding out that in the surveys like Gallup and several others and Barnes and all these other guys are doing these surveys, they're finding out that people are, are going to these churches, but they're not staying long because eventually it gets as monotonous as was said about the church services that weren't like that years ago. They're looking for passionate teaching not just practical but they're looking for something that will bring them to an encounter a life changing encounter with Jesus Christ mm -hmm. 
this series is after praying with the elders, talking with the elders, bringing it up, and going through what we feel, how we need to start this next new year, and what's going to be our focus. There's going to be four weeks of this series, and these are going to be our four focuses. And you're going, well, what are they? you got to come each week to find out. You'll find out what this one's going to be in just a moment, not yet. This is why I'm doing this series. I very rarely ever explain why I'm doing something, but I believe this is crucial. This is going to point how we're going to go. And it's going to tell you where the elders and leaders are, are heading. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 16, verse 18. And let me lay this out as you're turning there. Jesus, Jesus was just so cool. Okay? Jesus was just so cool. Because he truly is, if you really look at it, you know, I, I didn't coin it, I heard it, but I know who kind of coined it. Um, Jack Taylor coined this phrase. Uh, he called God, many times, he, you know, we say he's Jehovah Shalom, which is, you know, you know God of peace. You know, Jehovah this, Jehovah that. Well, he calls him Jehovah Sneaky. Because he's a God that will sneak up on you. Okay? Sometimes. And this is kind of what Jesus did with the disciples. He'd been with them for probably about two years or so now. We don't exactly know. but Probably around two years. And one day he's walking along the road. And look what he says. Let's read the whole section. Verse 13. Now, when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea, starting verse 13 of Matthew chapter 16. Caesarea Philippi. He was asking his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? Now, this is Jehovah Sneaky. He, you see how he, he phrased it? Who do the people say that the Son of Man is? And they said to him, some say John the Baptist, because John the Baptist had died about two years before that, and they think he came back from the dead. Some say John the Baptist, others Elijah, but still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. And then here he goes, Mr. Direct. And he said to them, but who do you say that I am? Now stop there. Now, this is, my, this is Ron's revised version of, of who he, Peter. Peter's probably standing there, probably didn't say much at this moment, which is unusual for Peter. The other disciples are probably going, John the Baptist, you know, Elijah, Jeremiah, just one of the prophets. And then Jesus goes, who do you say I am? And Peter probably went, ah, and went right up to the front, and this is what he says. Look what he says. He says this, verse 16, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. When he said you're the Christ, he gave the position that Jesus held, the Christ, the Messiah. And then he gave, he said, the son of the living God, which gave a, 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 a picture of his deity. So, so Peter said this, I know who you are. You're the Messiah, and you're also deified. You're God in the flesh. So here's what Peter, this was Peter's answer. It wasn't just, you know, you're really cool. I think you're the Messiah. You know, you're going to save the world, and you're going to bring Israel back into what Israel is supposed to have. Well, yes and no. That was kind of what Peter was hoping. But the bottom line is this. He laid out something, and I believe he spoke in many ways, probably prophetically. He said, you are the Messiah, the Christ the one who will save the world from, the, from its sins and reunite those who will believe with God the Father. And then he says, and you are our God come in the flesh. Now look what Jesus said. And Jesus said in verse 17, blessed are you Simon Barjona. That means Simon son of Jonah. Because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you. What does that tell us? What he did speak was prophetic. Catching this? And this is all not on the page here. And look what he says. Flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. Then he says this. Here we go. I also say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not overpower it. Now let me show you something. What we're going to use is this, that phrase, upon this rock. Look what it says. I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not overpower or prevail against it, as the King James says. Read that again. I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not overpower it. 
Now let me lay something out real quick. We're not going to get into it. But this is the passage that the Catholic Church takes and has the secession of popes where it came from. The very first pope they believe was Peter. And then everybody after that, God ordained, and that's what the church was built upon, the popes. Survey says, eh, wrong answer. That's not what this says. What Jesus says, upon that profession of faith, upon that solid rock of who you say that I am, I will build my church upon that profession of faith. So with that said, turn with me to Romans. Okay? Well, no, let's back up. Let's go to Acts chapter 2. Go to Acts chapter 2. This is the beginning of the church. So let me show you something real quick. Acts chapter 2, start in verse 36. Acts chapter 2, verse 36. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Now, let's stop there for a moment. Peter's preach stood up to preach a message, which there are those right now that are saying that we need to unhitch ourselves from the Old Testament. If you notice, the very first sermon that was preached, that the outpouring of the presence of God came, 3,000, over 3,000 souls got saved, and the church started. Most of the references are from the Old Testament. You can't unhitch the gospel from the Old Testament. Can't be done. And look what he says, verse 36 again. Therefore let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. And now when they heard this, they were pierced to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brethren, what shall we do? Peter said to them, Repent. Can't say that much anymore. And each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins, your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and your children, and for all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call to himself. And with many other words, he solemnly testified and kept on exhorting them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. So then, those who had received, look at, keep reading, had received his word, were baptized, and that day there were added about 3,000 souls. And they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. That was the beginning of the church. There was no marketing system. There was nothing. The scruffy old you know, fishermen stood up in the power of the Holy Spirit and preached a message of hellfire and brimstone, yelled at him, repent. He didn't just go, I think you really need to repent. How does that sound? No, he wasn't saying that. It was repent and save yourselves from this perverse generation. You say that now, it's called hate speech. But this is how the church started. This is how it came together. Turn with me to Romans chapter 1. One book over, Romans chapter 1. And look what Paul wrote in verse 16. We know this scripture. We've heard it many times. So look what it says. For I am not ashamed of the gospel. For it is a power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. I'm going to read that again. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is a power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and to the Greek. So here's my point. I want to tell you, what are we going to look at? The very first thing that we're going to look at is this, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Our plan, our strategy, our prayer is that we're going to, how this church is going to grow is first on the gospel of Jesus Christ. Unashamedly, we're going to preach the gospel. We're going to teach the gospel. We're going to tell people about the gospel. We're going to, the gospel is going to be the very foundation of what we do and the reason we do it. It's not going to be watered down. It's not going to be palatable. It's, not, it's going to be unpalatable. Because I'm going to show you why. Look at it. Let me tell you something here. God is holy and just. We all say amen, right? And it's, it's true. But do we know what that means? God is holy and just. The word holy, in fact, in Isaiah chapter 6, verse 3, we won't read it right now. The seraphim, in, in the vision that was given to Isaiah, the seraphim, their wings were out and they were flying around shouting, proclaiming, in a loud voice, holy, 
holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And they kept saying it over and over and over again. Holy means this. In the scriptures, both in the Old and New Testament, it's got the same meaning. Holy means this, pure, clean, perfect, without blemish or defect. In fact, in Habakkuk chapter 1, verse 13, I'll read it to you. It says this, Habakkuk chapter 1, verse 13, the very first part of it says, Your eyes are too pure to approve evil, and you cannot look on wickedness with favor. This is the God we serve. But it takes, and it, the beauty of it, it takes it and it balances the scale that we see today because what happens is that scale flips down so much because we're so worried about, you know, offending people. And I'm going to say some things, and it's not, I'm not knocking any churches. I'm thankful. I'm kind of like when, when they asked Paul, the, you know, the disciple, no, it asked Jesus. It, they told Jesus, there's some preaching in your name. He goes, leave me alone. <laughs> They're not for me. They're against me. So leave me alone. You know what? Leave them alone. It's fine. But I want to tell you where we're going. We're not going to water this down because God is holy. And God is so holy that we cannot go into his presence in and of ourselves. We can't even be in his presence because we would die because we're full of sin. Let me show you something else. He's just. The just is a legal term for giving a right sentence and judgment it means we give a right sentence in judgment and in truth. That what we do is truthful. In fact, in Nehemiah chapter 9, verse 33, Nehemiah says, he said, says this as a paraphrase. He goes, God, everything, every judgment you have ever made and everything you said against and for our people of Israel was just. Even his judgments, even his correction, even sending them into bondage and sending them into slavery was a just rendering of judgment it was right so if god is holy and god is just let me tell you something turn with me real quick to mark mark chapter 10 mark chapter 10 look at verse 17 now jesus is walking along the road and this very wealthy young man, probably a, uh, a Gen Xer, okay, he'd been around a while, he's, he, set, he, he set himself up, he did well, he's very wealthy, he was a ruler, he was a, very prominent in his, uh, and I'm not picking on Gen Xers, okay? It was just funny, because by the time you get to my age, you don't worry about it anymore, because if you ain't got you, ain't going to get it, okay? So here's this young man, comes up to him, look, and says, as he was sitting, setting out on a journey, Verse 17, a man ran up to him and knelt before him and asked, Good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good, good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not bear false witness, do not defraud, honor your father and your mother. And he said to him, Teacher, I have kept all these things from my youth. <laughs> You're right. Look at verse 21. Looking at him, Jesus felt love for him. And said to him, one thing you lack. Here's Jehovah Sneaky. Go and sell all your possessions and give to the poor. And you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. But at these words he was saddened and he went away grieving. For he was one who owned much property. Here's the truth. He comes up to Jesus and he says, good teacher. And Jesus answers an off the wall answer. He goes, why do you call me good? Only God is good. God the Father, he's good. Here's the truth. It's not mine. I wish I had it. I said it. The most terrifying truth in the scripture is God is good. It's terrifying. But nowadays it's not terrifying because we preach it in such a way that it's like a party. God is good. God is good. God's in a good mood. He is in a good mood. But he's good. And here's the truth. If God is good, what's so scary about it? We are not. We are not good. There's nothing about us good. Now here's the gospel. Here we go. Our condition is this. We have sinned. We are not good. Let me show you. Turn Romans chapter 3. 
I would encourage you, my friends, if you've never shared the gospel or you don't know how to take somebody through the Bible, I would encourage you to write these scriptures down. I'm going to take you through the gospel this morning. Romans chapter 3, look at verse 10. Romans 3, verse 10. As it is written, there is none righteous, not even one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become useless. There is none who does good. There is not even one. Their throat is an open grave. With their tongues they keep deceiving. The, the poison of asps is under their lips. Whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness? Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their paths. And the path of peace they have not known. There's no fear of God before their eyes. You think we need to keep going? No. Stop there. This is our condition. And this also is taken from Psalm 53. You look up Psalm 53, you can see a lot of this in there. This is where Paul, when he wrote this, got this. Why? Because he knew the Old Testament. We think that we are so good that we deserve heaven. We deserve eternal life. And if you don't think that's true, look at what's going on in our world today. How many commercials do you see where you say, get what you deserve. You deserve this new car. I deserved, uh, uh, I saw the other day and I was agreeing with them. They had a brand new Dodge truck on TV and it says, you deserve this. <laughs> and I went, yes, I do, amen. If I... <laughs> You know, I, I almost went name and claim it right there. Okay? Prosperity theology was wooing me over. No, I'm kidding. But we see this. Everything, that, you know, even, even our celebrities are talking about, hey, you deserve this. You de we don't deserve any of that. We deserve hell. But we can't say that because it sounds so discouraging. It's not. Because before we come to the encouragement part, we have to see the reality. The reality is this, I'm a wicked, evil man without Jesus. And even one sin, one small sin, taking a pencil from work that doesn't belong to me is stealing. And if I never did anything in my life but that one thing, I would deserve hell because it's sin. It goes against the very character and nature of God. If God is holy and God is just and God is good, then all of it, then I need to be like that to be in his presence. Because his eyes are too pure to look upon wickedness and look upon sin. And if I stole one pencil, he can't look at me because it goes against his nature. You with me so far? Okay, turn with me to Romans chapter 3, verse 23. It says this, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. For all have sinned. This is our condition. Every one of us, there's not a person on this earth that hasn't sinned. In fact, Jesus, he used this, for lack of a better term, this very example with the rich young ruler. The rich young ruler said, I've kept all those things. I'm a good guy. Made a lot of money and did it with a good heart. And Jesus said, he said he felt love for him. You know why? Because there was a special kind of stupid on the guy. <laughs> Just like us. It takes a special kind of stupid to think we're holy enough to be in God's presence without Christ. And that sounds kind of judgmental. It's not. And Jesus loved him and he said, then good, do you lack one thing? And he hit him right where the sin was. He said, go sell everything you have and give it to the poor and you come follow me. It says he went away sad. Why? Because he wasn't righteous. He wasn't good. He wasn't, he did, he had sin in his life. And you know what it was called? Idolatry. Every, even our efforts, every effort that we make to be good and wicked. I mean, be good is wicked. Every effort we make to get to God, we won't get. Isaiah chapter 64, verse 6 says this. For all of us have become like one who is unclean. And all our right, righteousness, all of our righteous deeds are like a filthy garment. And all of us 
wither like a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind take us away. We, we say this, all of our righteous acts are like filthy rags. I'm going to get real gross with you for a second. What that references is menstrual rags. That's what that means in the Hebrew. They're that dirty. To most, they're that disgusting. And he gave us a, a picture of what our so-called good attempts and good deeds mean to God outside of Christ. But he still loves us. See, even in that, he still loves us. Because why? Because God can't just, imagine if God said this, hey, listen, I'm good, I'm righteous, I'm just, and you know what, I'm just going to just say, forgive you, don't worry about it. Would that have been just? No. No, because there has to be a penalty. There's a punishment for that. We have to pay the price for what we've done. Let me show you something else. Look at Romans 6.23. It says this, Romans chapter 6, verse 23. Look at the very first part of it. For the wages of sin is death. Stop there. Don't go any further. The wages of sin is death. The righteous and rightful compensation for a life that is characterized by sin is death. It was set forth in the Old Testament covenant that once a year there had to be a spotless lamb that had to be given for the sins of the people to justify them for one year. And it was so scary that when the high priest went into the Holy of Holies to take the blood and to pour it on the mercy seat, and hopefully God would accept it. They would tie a rope around his ankle. And on his garment, on the priestly garments, there was, there was a picture. There was a, like, engra not engravings, um, little pomegranate wooden carvings. And they were right next to the bell. It was a pomegranate bell, pomegranate bell. Po and what it would do, as long as he moved, those pomegranates would hit the bells. But if they heard a ching, ching, boom. And nothing, they knew that God didn't accept the sacrifice. And they couldn't go in, so they had to pull him out with a rope because God would kill him because he's so holy. You're going, wait, but, but Jesus isn't like that. Let me, remember when Peter was on the boat and Jesus was there and Jesus said, throw your net over on the other side? And he pulled the thing in. What did Peter do when he recognized it? He turned, he said, Lord, depart from me for I am a sinful man. He cowered in the boat and couldn't even look at Jesus because he recognized who he was and his own sinfulness, he became aware of it in that boat. He said, depart from me, for I'm a sinful man. Why? Because he knew the truth that I'm going to die if you stay here because of my sin. This is how amazing and how scary, because God is good and we are not. If God is truly just, what does he do with us? How does he pardon a wicked human race and still be a just God? This is how. God's provision. Christ died for us. Look at Romans 6.23. For the wages of sin is death, but, take your pen and circle that word, but. Here's the alternative. Here's where God comes in, but. The free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Jesus is the Father's provision. Jesus is the Father's provision. God come in the flesh. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. All things were created by him, and not anything that was created was not created. In him is life, and that life is the light of men. We, we hear all that. God come in the flesh. God came, the Word of God clothed himself in human flesh, and he was perfect. He was God and he was man, all in one. And in that, he offered himself as the sacrifice for our sin. Jesus died for our sin. 2 Corinthians says this, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. Look with me real quick, if you want. It says, he made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf, so that we might become the righteousness of of God in him. Here's the neat part. We
we were so wicked, the human race, that God had to make a way for us because he loved us so much that he couldn't stand being without us. And he provided a way that we either can reject or accept. And in that, he took upon himself human flesh. He clothed himself this way so that he could be the sacrifice for our sins. And in that, and accepting that sacrifice, accepting the atonement for our sins, we are now clothed with the righteousness of God. In fact, it's like this. Let me see. John, come here for a second. Can I embarrass you? Probably. Come here. Now, look at John. He's a handsome thing, isn't he? Okay. All the ladies gone. Ah, he's so good looking. Okay. So he's handsome. And I'm embarrassing him. He'll never trust me again. Okay. But on the inside, John's a wicked, evil guy. And he realizes it one day. Okay. Even though his hair is cool, he realizes it one day. Okay? So John says, I need Jesus. I want to be close to God, so I need Jesus. So Jesus says, I'll die for you. I'll give my life for you. And he says, I accept that. And so Jesus does this. He says, here, here's my righteousness. Put it on. Now. <laughs> A little big for you, but that's all right. But now, but think about it, it's, it's kind of funny, but is not his righteousness a little big on us? Now John can go before the Father, okay? He can stand, like if, 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 if Walker's the Father, Father God, he can stand before Father God because he's not standing in his own righteousness. Because his own righteousness are filthy rags. They don't work. They can never get him close to God. But because of what Jesus did, Jesus is standing alongside him, and he goes, you have my righteousness, so let's go to the Father together. And when, they, when the Father sees John, he sees John, but he sees Jesus at the same time. And he sees the faith of, uh, face of Christ, and he sees the righteousness of Christ. He sees the blood of Christ upon him. And now John can go before God and say, you're my Father too. Because of that. And John knows his truth. And John is going to be forever clothed in the righteousness of God. Even when John messes up, he's going to be clothed. He's got the righteousness of the Father upon him. And John's going to live forever because of the sacrifice Jesus made for him. Sound good? All right, thanks, buddy. Give him my coat back. <laughs> Give him a hand. Give him a hand. So that's how it's all about. Jesus is the perfect demonstration of the Father's love. Turn to Romans 5.8. Romans 5.8. Romans chapter 5, verse 8. But God, see, now stop there. Anytime you see that in your Bible, circle it. But God. Because before that, it's talking about us. Then it says, but God. But God demonstrates his own love towards us. Whose love? His love. His own love. Not somebody else's love. Not a masquerade. Not, not saying, well, I'm going to love you for this. No, his own love. But God demonstrates his own love towards us. In that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. It means this. That word demonstrate is really interesting because it means to set forth with or before somebody. To declare to show, to make known. It means God took, and when we were standing there, couldn't get to him, we couldn't even be in his presence, God took and he made a demonstration. He clothed his son in human flesh and set his son before the whole world. He said, this is the way. This is going to be how, how it's going to happen. In fact, in, first, in, in the Gospel of John chapter 1, it says, he went to his own and his own didn't receive him. And there's another way of saying it. His own rejected him. But he demonstrated. He didn't just tell us about it. He demonstrated. He gave a visible, tangible, physical demonstration of his love, his righteous, just, perfect love in his son, Jesus Christ. This is not a game. This is not a Sunday social club. 
This is about the gospel of Jesus Christ. And if someone doesn't accept it, they will spend eternity in hell, burning in fire, separated from God for all eternity. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9 says, For by grace are you saved through faith. It's that not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works, so that no one can boast. No man can boast. We can't boast and brag about it. It was God's grace that saved us through Jesus Christ. There's no other way. In John chapter 14, verse 6, it says this, if you want to write this down. Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Do you know that over 50%, about 52% of evangelicals today believe that there's more than one way to God? People that are, some of you may believe it. Let me tell you, it's not true. It's a lie. There's only one way to God through Jesus Christ. But over 52% of evangelicals sitting in church this morning believe that there's more than one way to get, to get to God. Jesus is just one way. But his own words said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but through me. Acts chapter 4, four verse 12 says this. In fact, we sang this this morning. Jesus, uh, no, excuse me, and there is salvation in no, no one else, for there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. None. So we see that in this short presentation that Christ is the provision for our sins. So what do we do? Our response is believe and receive. And that's not... Prosperity theology, and I'm not trying to be funny. Turn to Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10. Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10. Let's start in verse 8. But what does it say? <laughs> and by the way, this is an Old Testament. This is from Deuteronomy chapter 30. If you look on your, if you've got a reference Bible, you look to the right or to the left, wherever your references are, it'll tell you Deuteronomy 30, verse 14. The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. That is, the word of faith which we are preaching. That, here's the word of faith that they're preaching. That, if, we, if you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart a person believes. That's the first step resulting in righteousness. With the mouth, he confesses, resulting in salvation. So what do we do? We believe and we receive. We confess. Many people acknowledge that Jesus is both the Son, Son of God and Lord of the universe. But Paul is speaking of the deep, personal, abiding conviction that without any reservation or qualification, we'll confess Jesus as Lord. That is, we'll confess that Jesus is the believer's own sovereign, ruling Lord, in whom alone he trusts for salvation and to whom he submits. This is not a game. This is not just Jesus is my buddy. This is not Jesus is my pal. This is not Jesus is my bro. And I'm not trying to be funny, but it's funny when I do it. It's not what this is. If we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and it's actually as Lord, then we're confessing that he is my ruling sovereign. He is my master. See, we don't like that because it doesn't give that sonship that he's my dad, he's my, my, my father, and he is. But first, before we ever get into that, we have to come to him and say, you are my master, you are my Lord, you are the one that I serve. And in that, he takes us from that and he adds to that the sonship of a son, of a child. We become a child of God. But even a true child, a child is obedient to their father and their mother. Is he not? Maybe not our children, but mo they should be. Okay? But they should be obedient. Because they serve at times and we serve them. But this is even deeper than that. This is God is my master and Jesus has become my Lord. And I wholeheartedly, you know, with no reservations, unreservedly, giving my life completely to him. 
I now have handed my life over to Jesus Christ because of what he did for me on the cross. Because he paid that price. And with that confession, I believe. This is the action of that faith. Remember, I tell you all the time, there's faith and there's believing. Faith is the foundation. Believing, believing is the action. And so what do we do? First, with the heart man believes and is granted righteousness. And second, with the mouth he confesses is in granted salvation. We believe. This is the action. We say, he's my master, so that's how I'm going to live. And we step out in faith and live for Jesus. And my life begins to show it. That's why we went through 1 John with all the birthmarks of a Christian in 1 John. If you don't have these birthmarks somewhere showing up in your life, you need to examine your life to see whether you're a Christian or not. Because if I'm a Christian, I serve God because of Jesus Christ. So with all that said, turn back to Matthew chapter 16. And by the way, the quick road is called the Roman road. You start with, with Romans chapter 3, verse 10, that there's no one righteous, no, not one. And you go to Romans 3, 23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And you go to Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God. See, it's a two-part. It leads us into the next part. The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Then you go to Romans 5, 8, for God demonstrated his love towards us. And that while we are at sinners, Christ died for us. And you go to Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10. If we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord, as Lord and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, we shall be saved. That's a simple way of telling the gospel to, Jesus, to, to anybody, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Look at Matthew chapter 16, verse 18. Again, he says, Upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Many of the, the men of old, the ones that, that many quote, many preachers quote, many Christians quote from Spurgeon to uh, Wigglesworth to um, Eusebius to all these guys all the way down, all the way through, all the way to Jesus, and all the way from Jesus up to today, the majority of them say that I would rather have a church of 300 or less that are sold out to God than a, a massive church filled with people who are lukewarm. But that's not judgment. That's not saying, well, good, we just, we just only want the people that are just going to love God. No. We want anyone to come. Everyone. Do you know, when, do you know where, where in the Bible it gives the gospel? In like one verse? Turn with me. 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Look at verse 1, and I'll show you the verse in a second. Chapter 15, verse 1. Now I make known to you, brethren, the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received, in which you also stand. That's the same word that's used in Ephesians. By standing against the enemy. We stand prepared in this. Look at verse 2. By which also you are saved. You see what he's talking about? The gospel by which we're saved. If you hold fast the word which I preach to you, unless you believed in vain. Here's the gospel, verse 3. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. And that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. And after that he appeared to more than 500 brethren at one time, most of whom remain until now, but some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James and goes on and on. And he says, and he appeared to me, the least of the apostles. This is the gospel, the simple gospel, that Jesus Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. He wasn't talking about what we call the New Testament today. He was talking about the Old Testament. You can't unhitch the gospel from the Old Testament. This week, I want to tell you a story. And if I start to cry, forgive me, because it, it totally blessed me. 
it been, it's been quite a while since this, something like this has happened. I went to the bank to do some stuff for the, for the church. And I've been in there enough over the last nine years that I know a lot of the people in there. Okay, when I come in, they go, hey, hey, how you doing, how you doing? I can't remember their names because I can't remember mine half the time. But I know their faces. And, and so when I came in, this, this little sweet lady was there, and she always helps me and does all the um, uh, notarizing for me because I don't want to get five bucks of UPS. So I go over there. So I walk in, and she sees me, and she goes, hey, how are you? I said, good, good to see you, darling. She goes, what, what can I do? I said, I came to you. I need something to notarize, and I only come to you. And she goes, oh, thank you. you know, and she goes, she says, come in, come in. So we sit down, and we start. She goes, okay, what do you need? And I show her the paperwork, and we go through all the stuff, and we're doing all the business stuff. And, and she goes, how you been? She's doing stuff. She goes, can I talk to you while I'm doing this? I said, you better, because if not, I'm going to talk to you, and I get boring. <laughs> and she goes, oh, no, no. And she starts doing her stuff. And, and she's talking to me, and she's asking me how I'm doing, how's my family, how's this, how's that, what's new, da, 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 da. And so then... Um, she said something. She goes, so are you staying busy? I said, oh, this is, I said, I'm a pastor. She goes, that's right. I said, yeah. I said, I'm a pastor. I said, this is what we call the busy season. It's all the holiday stuff. And so I said, it's, it really picks up around here. She says, yeah. She goes, she goes, wow. She goes, you probably haven't been doing it long, right? I said, I've been doing it for almost 40 years. And she goes, 40, when, did you, when did you start? I said, when I was two. No, I get it. <laughs> I didn't say, I wanted to, but I didn't. I, because all of a sudden, I sensed that God was doing something. And I said, I started when I was 21. I said, that's when I, I, I said, but I gave my heart to Christ before that. And she goes, this is no joke. She was sitting there, and she was on her computer, and she stopped. And she turned, and she goes, what do you mean? All of a sudden, God manifested right there and I said I was 17 years old and I was dying I was said I had so much drugs in my body my, my pediatrician back then told me I would die before I'm 21 if I didn't change my ways and she goes what happened I said my grandmother dragged me for lack of a better term to church and for several months I would go to church and I would sit there stoned and she goes Really? I went, yeah. I was sitting in the back row stone out of my mind. I said, but on Easter Sunday night, 1975, I was up in the front, and I heard the gospel of Jesus Christ, that Jesus died for my sins, and that he rose from the grave to buy me eternal life. And I knew I needed to change, and I couldn't do it on my own. And she is glued to me and I said and on that that church pew which is a seat I said I gave my heart to Jesus Christ and I walked outside and I took my drugs out of my pocket and I threw them in the garbage and I said never again and she goes what did you do I said I went back to high school the next day and I told my friends I couldn't do this anymore she goes did they did, were they still your friends after that I said no I said, but that was okay. I said, and God so radically changed my life. And a couple years later, I said, I felt him ask me to be a preacher. And I said, I would do it. She goes, I have never heard that story before. I said, God loves you. And she goes, I love God. I do. She goes, but I don't. And she's shaking her head and she goes, that's powerful. I said, yes, it is. It's the gospel is what's powerful. It changed my life. I said, and now Jesus abides in me, and I'm in him, and I know I'll spend eternity in heaven. And she goes, wow, wow. And she turns back around, and I saw her kind of do this, and she starts typing. And so she gets back to the business, and then... Excuse me. And then at the very end is where she notarizes the stuff, and I'm getting ready to leave. I said, thank you. You're always so kind. She goes, that story. She goes, that's, that's stuck here. And I said, good. I said, God loves you. And she goes, thank you, Mr. Wallace. 
thank you. She didn't get saved. But Jesus just rented a whole plot in her head with the gospel. That's what it's about. That is the beginning of church growth, is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let me show you some. 2 Corinthians, and we're going to be done. 2 Corinthians chapter, chapter 5. Let me show you this. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Look at verse 16. Therefore, from now on, we recognize no one according to the flesh, even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet now we know him in this way no longer. Which means it's not about who he is. We know him personally. We know him in the spirit. We know him in our hearts. Verse 17, therefore, therefore, now see, did you catch that? We know him in the spirit. We know him in our hearts. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things passed away. Behold, new things have come. Now all these things are from God. That means all these things that happen to us are from God. All that he gives us is from him who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us a ministry of reconciliation. And reconciliation means an exchange. Namely, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and he has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were making an appeal through us. We beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf, so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. That's it. That's what Mary Evan Church is going to be. Nothing else. Not arrogant, not mean, not, but we're going to grow with the first thing is by the gospel, that we know the gospel and we're telling people about the gospel. We want them saved before they get here or at least thinking about it when they do come. And you're going to hear the gospel and we're not going to be ashamed of the gospel. And we're going to proclaim the gospel by not only our words but by how we live because that's what's attractive. The church is not an event. She, the church, is made up of all who are truly saved. She grows as believers take their place as ambassadors of Christ and share the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The church was never made for unbelievers. Never. It's not made up of unbelievers. Just because you're on a roll of a church doesn't mean that you're saved. Just like if you're in a, standing in a garage, it doesn't make you a car. We're only saved through the gospel of Jesus Christ. And when it happens, we are now part of the universal church of God. That means all the other believers are connected to them. And then you, I encourage you, join a church, get on the roll, become a part. But until then, the first step to get people to come to growth in church is to be ambassadors for Jesus Christ. That's it. Because they're going to come because you invited them. They're going to come because they see something in your life. They're going to come because you told them about Jesus. Or you witnessed to them by your life about Jesus. Or there's something so attractive about you, not your hair, not anything else, but something in here that's so attractive that they're going to come because they want to know what you've got. That's how the church grew. That's how 3,000 people were saved under the preaching. And also they saw what was going on in the lives of those 120 believers on Pentecost that day. I want to go to a church where there's burning words in the lives of believers and in the lives of the preacher. That there's burning, that there's fire, there's passion in it. That's what attracts. And God takes us and he uses us to draw people to Christ. That's it. That's how a church grows. Where do you stand with him today? Are you wishy-washy? Are you lukewarm? Are you, you know, there's no such thing as standing on the fence. You're either for Christ or you're not. There's no, and, I, and I'm, I'm catching myself. I'm never going to use that again. Nowhere does it even talk about standing on a fence or even give a hint of that. We're either for Christ or we're not. We're either saved or we're not. Where do you stand today?
Are you on fire enough to tell people about Jesus? Are you looking for opportunities to tell people about Jesus? Are you aware when God opens a door and all of a sudden you see him go, now? Because some water, some plant, some water, some harvest, and sometimes we may plant and we don't harvest that one, but we're going to harvest somebody else's that planted. It doesn't matter. We're all in this together. Plant, I want to harvest. Water, I want to harvest. I'll water so you can harvest. I'll plant so you can water. That's what it's about. That's church growth. That's Bible growth. Where are you at with Christ today? Let's pray. Let's pray. Spend some time in prayer. Where are you with Jesus today? In just a moment, we're going to have some up here that will pray for you, but you can still come and kneel and pray. Get your hearts and lives right with God. Spend that moment. If you don't know Jesus this moment, if you can't say that you know beyond a shadow of a doubt that if you died right now, that you would spend eternity with Jesus, then come and see somebody. See me, see somebody else up here, and tell them, I want to be sure today. You can be sure. You can be sure. Today is the day. If you, if you say, I just, I need some, I need a fresh infilling of the Holy Spirit to ask him. And then get up and get somebody to pray for you. If you need healing today, get somebody to pray for you. Keep pressing in. God is good. And he's good in Jesus Christ. And through Christ, he gives us good things. It says that in the word. He gives us good gifts. Come, come in just a moment and pray. Seek the Lord. Seek him. Father, I pray as we worship that Lord. And today, change and start something new. Start something new that is old. The old ways with a new fire, a new passion. The gospel of Jesus Christ. Make that prevalent this morning in our lives and hearts. In your name we pray. Amen. Let's stand and worship. I'm going to ask those who are going to help me in prayer to come forward. There'll be some that will be happy to pray for you. Somebody over here, somebody over here. I'll be in the middle. Just come and pray. Come and pray. Let's sing. That welcomes me. The kindness of mercy.
God, you're so good. Father, I pray, as we're about to go, that, Lord, that we will go with a greater understanding and desire and passion for the gospel of Jesus Christ. That, Lord, we will go with your words upon our lips and your words burning in our hearts and in our bones. I pray that, Lord, you increase that. As, Lord, we've been praying for revival, I pray that revival will come in such a way, Lord, <clears throat> that the gospel will be so prevalent in our lives that we can't talk about anything else. That, Lord, it will be the very driving force to be ambassadors of Jesus Christ and share the gospel with those who are dying. Lord, may we who have life give life to the dying through the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, Lord, may we go in your power, in your presence, and in your strength. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people.